good morning. This one. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Mihai Budiu, and uh, I'm a researcher in this lab. I uh, work upstairs. And uh, today, I'll be talking to you about uh, crunching uh, big data. And as the picture suggests, this can be actually a very satisfying uh, process. But uh, before I talk to you about crunching big data, I want to tell you a, a story which uh, happened uh, more than 500 years ago, which I find uh, very enlightening. And uh, the story has uh, two characters. The first character is this guy, uh, Tiho Brahe. He used to be a Danish astronomer, and uh, during the last years of his life, he worked at the uh, court of the King of Prussia in uh, Prague. And uh, he, he was the last in a line of uh, so-called naked eye astronomers. His uh, eyesight was very good, and he actually is very well known for doing a lot of observations on the motion of planets and stars and celestial objects. He compiled uh, large amounts of data. And uh, the other character in the story is this guy, Johannes Kepler, uh, who is like 25 years younger than uh, Tiho. So Kepler actually was uh, born prematurely, and apparently he was a very weak and a sickly person during his whole life. And perhaps most importantly for this story, his eyesight was very poor. So he, he wasn't able to do any, any astronomical observations. But uh, he had another gift. He was a very talented mathematician. And uh, the two guys met, and they worked together for a year. And uh, after Tiho's death, uh, Johannes Kepler took his job. And uh, what they did was something amazing. So uh, Tiho was very secretive about his measurements. He wouldn't share them with anybody. But he was so impressed with uh, Kepler's mathematical abilities that he gave him access to all his measurements and said, see, maybe, maybe you can derive some, something out of this. So, so this is really how uh, Tiho's measurements look. If you, if you go, this is actually a, a page from a book printed in 1630. So there's uh, you know, uh, pages, hundreds of pages like this with uh, very accurate observations. But uh, what both, uh, both these people wanted is insight. And uh, actually, Kepler worked very hard with those measurements. He tried to fit mathematical formulas. And he spent more than 20 years to derive what something in the end is absolutely beautiful. So he showed that all these numbers in the, um, in the end can be expressed by a very simple law, a very simple set of laws, which are known today as Kepler's laws of planetary motion. And for example, Kepler discovered that planets orbit the sun in ellipses and not circles or other funny shapes. And uh, Kepler's laws really opened the whole field of physics uh, to the Newtonian mechanics, which came later and which has been uh, a very good approximation of reality for 200 years. So it, it had a lot of uh, enabling, uh, enabling power. So uh, why am I telling this story? Because I. I think this shows that science hasn't changed that fundamentally in 500 years. So if you, if you forward to, to the current day, we're doing science roughly in the same way, right? So we, we build experimental devices and we collect huge amounts of data. For example, this is maybe the largest physics experiment ever devised, the Large Hadron Collider. And it's estimated to generate 15 petabytes of raw data a year. And then what we build is we build a lot of tools to analyze and extract insight from these measurements. For example, this is the a grid that physicists all over the world on all the five continents have built. It's called the Large Hadron Collider Grid, and it has more than 200,000 computing cores. And uh, it's working to analyze this data. So one thing that has changed, although the paradigm of collecting data and analyzing data hasn't changed, one thing that has changed has, is the amount of data. So now we're generating much more data, and much more than we could print in a book or analyze by hand. And uh, you know, uh, astronomy uh, or physics are not the only sciences which generate a lot of data. For example, bi biology, this, this chart shows you the size of the genome expressed in base pairs for a lot of organisms. You know, some simple ones have only millions of them. We uh, humans are very proud of, our, proud of ourselves. We think are at the top of evolution, but actually we only have about uh, 20 billion base pairs. There's some flowering plants which have up to uh, 100 billion base pairs. And it turns out that some problems in, uh, in the genomics are, are much more complicated than that, because you need to compare genomes to each other, and then you need to assemble fragments. So this is a lower bound in the complexity you need to tackle. And I, I could really spend the whole day talking about sources of big data, but uh, data really is all around us. It shows up in, in, all, in all areas. But what we, need, what we need is to build a set of tools to tackle big data. So we need to be able to, to acquire big data. We need to be able to store the big data reliably. We need to be able to transport big data. We need to be able to secure the big data. And we need to be able to, most importantly, perhaps, process the big data and extract out of it insight, the way Kepler did with his beautiful laws of planetary motion. And uh, uh, 
What are the tools that we need to process big data? Well, the best tool we have today are big computers. So this is, this is how computing really looks today. There's a lot of these data centers humming and uh, crunching data today. And uh, one of the goals of many research projects in this lab is to build tools which enable people to program those large computers as easily as they would program a laptop. So this is what we really want to do. So uh, as I said, we have a lot of interesting research projects, but I chose only three illustrations for you today. And uh, those illustrations are the most easily measured because I will talk about projects which led into direct uh, products that were very successfully uh, transferred as technology. But uh, there's many more that I could talk about, and there's many more you can find out when you roam the, the hallways. I'll be very happy to talk to you about uh, some other. And there's a lot of that I don't even know about. So uh, the first uh, project I want to tell you is, uh, is connected with Bing. So Bing is uh, Microsoft's search engine, and it's According to some uh, estimate, it serves more than 4 billion uh, queries per month. And uh, uh, of course, the job of any search engine is to index the web and to uh, extract, separate the, the quality information from the spam. And now, if you look behind Bing, what you will see is a very large scale data analytics engine, which uh, is in charge of crunching the, the data from the web and the data from the queries people ask and the data from the results people like, and then uh, improve the quality of the results. And at the core of this large-scale analytics engine is a distributed system which is called Dryad. And, and Dryad was designed and built in this lab starting in 2005. And the Dryad has been deployed since 2006 and has been running continuously for, for the Bing analytics. Today, it runs on several tens of thousands of machines and moves more than 10 petabytes of data every day. And uh, it's, it's been a really successful uh, uh, research project. So what's Dryad doing? What, what Dryad is doing is really taking thousands of machines and putting it together to act as a one single machine with seemingly infinite resources. And this is much harder than it looks because you have to make that machine be reliable. When you have so many moving parts, some of them will break all the time. So that's the main goal of Dryad. Now, let me tell you about a second project. Um, so this project was done uh, in collaboration with the Windows HPC uh, group. So HPC is an acronym which stands for High Performance Computing. And High Performance Computing is this branch of computing which is interested in building uh, supercomputers and programming them. And uh, the main customers for this kind of uh, computation resources are people in sciences, especially you know, climate modeling, weapons modeling, and uh, countless other applications. So uh, uh, the Windows HPC is a product, but uh, we actually had a very successful collaboration with them. And uh, on top of this product, we transfer some of our research projects, which uh, are now in a, a beta. And th they are all uh, uh, optimized for processing big data. So let me tell you a few words about each of them. So we worked on three layers of the stack. The one in the middle is the same execution engine that I talked about in the context of Bing, Dryad. But we also uh, worked on distributed storage and uh, programming languages. So in distributed storage, what we built is a system which, given a cluster with many thousands of machines, assembles the disks of all these machines into a seemingly infinite storage pool, which is reliable. So you can, you can reliably store the data, you can reliably retrieve the data, and you can reliably process the data on these disks as, as easily as you would on a single machine. And then uh, the top layer is, uh, is really a programming language. So uh, it, it, it's... Uh, Having jobs that execute on large computer clusters is, uh, is great, but somebody has to write the programs. And this, this uh, programming language, which is just called Dryad Link, gives you the illusion of programming a single computer in a very high level language. It's actually uh, programmed using .NET. And so it gives you a lot of productivity. It's, it's very easy to, from your uh, single machine to launch computations which span tons of thousands of computers. And uh, finally, let me tell you about the last project, which was uh, very successful. And uh, this is a theme which you've uh, already seen a lot during the previous talk. It's about the Kinect device. And uh, this is a screenshot of a, a Kinect tracker. So uh, as, as Oli told you already in the previous talk, uh, the way Kinect works is uh, it, it has to find where you are in front of the device. And one of the steps of this computation of the, is uh, figuring out from the, the depth map, which comes from the camera, figure out where, where your body parts are. So uh, that's the task. So the, the machine has to run an algorithm which labels body parts. 
But who's going to write that algorithm? You know, it, how do you describe to somebody else what a human is? What's a human shape? That's a very difficult problem. And uh, you can uh, ask yourselves, how do you know, for example, what a human is? And, and if, you, if you look carefully, you will notice that you actually have learned this information. When you were a baby in your crib, your parents came around and said, look, this is mama, this is daddy, you know, this is my uh, nose, these are the eyes, this is the ear. And uh, by seeing these examples hundreds and thousands of times, ev every day during your first year of life, you actually learned how to recognize humans. So, so uh, the, we use a similar process because the, it's too complicated to describe what a human is. We let the machines learn by looking at lots of examples. So, and uh, this process of, of learning from data is a very large discipline of computer science and very active today. And it's still very young. There's still a lot of stuff to do. It's called machine learning. And what machine learning does is by looking at a lot of examples, it builds something called a classifier. And the classifier learns information that it, it wasn't ever shown. For example, the classifier will, uh, will run on the Xbox. Although we feed a lot of data to build this classifier, the classifier is a very small and very compact object. So you can run it on a single machine. And then this classifier can then see new information it's never seen before and classify it correctly. So uh, a, new, a new position, a new 3D uh, depth map, and it can generate the correct body labeling. So now, it turns out that in order to have a high quality classifier, because of the huge variability of human bodies, you have to feed millions of training examples. And to do that, you have to have a lot of computational power to analyze all these examples. So what we did was, uh, in collaboration with the Kinect uh, team, we actually built a cluster computing engine, which uh, relied on some of the layers I've told you before, which, which uh, enabled us to write this classifier to run on a cluster very quickly. So you will see some of the layers here. The Dryer Distributed Execution Engine is the same, which powers the Bing Data Analytics Engine. It is the same, which runs on the high-performance computing platform. And the programming language Dryer Link is, is the same on the previous slide. It's the language which allows you to program a large cluster. And then on top of this, we built a library of machine learning algorithms. And then uh, as a specific machine learning application, we built this Decision Forest uh, uh, Training Engine. Be this, this classifier is technically a Decision Forest. And then we, this, this has been running continuously uh, on, uh, in Xbox, uh, learning new data from new examples. All right. So, so the, as I said, there's much more I could tell you. But uh, le let me move back and uh, talk a little about the vision about cloud computing. So, so what I show on this slide is a, is a very simple device, a device that everybody understands, at least in uh, North America. Uh, in uh, Europe, they look slightly differently. So it's, it's a power plug, right? So uh, they are in, on the walls of our houses. And they, uh, you could argue that they are an essential ingredient of civilization. And uh, uh, they, they are cheap, reliable. Everybody has them, and we assume they are there, right? But if you look behind them, how do we get the power? There's an immense infrastructure. It's very complicated. And, and uh, there's a lot of people that work very hard to make this, this service so reliable, so cheap, and, and so affordable. Well, our vision for cloud computing is the same. So someday, cloud, the cloud, the, the computation will be a service, and you can just tap into it. And you, know, you will have a standardized interface to it. But somebody, somebody has to do the work for you to provide this reliable service. And this is what we do here, right? We work on making sure that the foundations of the cloud are as strong, as reliable, and as affordable as electricity. So this is all I had for you today.